Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello. Uh, welcome to the first inaugural public lecture and stargazing event in Caltech Astronomy. This is going to be a, a monthly event uh, from now on. And if you didn't see either online or uh, from the flyers out in the front that you're welcome to take, uh, we have the, the full spring lecture series planned out and advertised. And the next one will be a month from now, March 18th, also a Friday night. These will tend to be Friday nights. Uh, it's at 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. And it's, it's, uh, it's all about aurorae, the, the northern lights on, on, on other planets in the solar system. So it should be super exciting. Um, other announcements to make. There was also a flyer outside that shows roughly what the, the night sky looks like in, at our latitude in the northern hemisphere at this, this time of the year. Uh, hopefully you'll, you guys will be able to join us outside uh, for some of the observing that's going on later tonight after the lecture. Uh, and also after the lecture, we're going to have kind of an informal panel that you guys are welcome to, to jump into. Well, we'll not sit up here, but, but jump into the audience of and watch about gravitational waves, since that was such a, uh, a great discovery that was announced last week here at Caltech. Uh, so we have three uh, specialists in the field of gravitational wave astronomy, one person from the LIGO team, one person who works on pulsar timing arrays, another venue for discovering gravitational waves and detecting them in different, different frequency range, and then uh, a theorist who, I don't know where Leo is, Leo's somewhere here. Oh, there's Leo, a uh, the theorist who works in the field of gravitational waves. So we will have all three of them up here to answer your questions about the field or just general questions about the field of physics and astronomy. So that'll be going on, but you're free to come, come, in, come in for this or, or go outside and check out what we have. Uh, you guys probably saw the weather was clear, so we should be able to observe. Um, and in case you didn't see, the way to get to observing after the lecture is to go out the front door, go around, go past these windows, and on the right side there will be a gate that's open that takes you onto the field where you can, you can observe through the telescopes that we have set up out there. Uh, there's no food, drink, smoking, or pets allowed either in here or out on the field. I just have to say that because I don't want us to lose the the privilege of being able to use these facilities. And we are recording this event tonight, uh, and it will be posted on our website afterwards, so you can share it with your friends or watch it again. I don't know. Uh, and finally, if, if you need to find volunteers like myself, uh, what's that? Yes, the full period will be recorded. Even me yapping away right now is probably being recorded. <laughs> um, if you're looking for volunteers, we're wearing little badges like this. And if you see people outside who have flashing red lanyards, mm -hmm. those, are the, those are the volunteers. So you can find them in the dark. Um, and, and lastly, I wanted to get a rough informal survey from the attendees here to know how our advertising is going and such. So can you raise your hand if you are in some way affiliated with Caltech, as, either as a student or a staff member or an alum? Okay, so roughly 40%, 30%. Okay. Uh, raise your hand if you're coming from Pasadena specifically. Okay, interesting, interesting. Uh, and how did you hear about our events? Did you hear about it from Twitter? Raise your hand. One person, one Twitter user. Excellent. Okay. Uh, have you heard about it from Facebook? Okay, a few. Uh, if you heard about it, if you found our website just because you were scrolling through the interwebs and you came upon it, okay. Uh, if you got it from the Caltech newsletter or the, the newspaper that came out a couple of days ago. Well, then how the heck did everybody else find out about this? Word of mouth. Word of mouth. The speaker. Okay, okay, well, good. Word of mouth always works. Excellent. Okay, well, then I will, uh, I'm happy to introduce our speaker for tonight, Evan Kirby, who's a professor here. Uh, he did his, his PhD research at UC Santa Cruz and then did a postdoc here, a Hubble Fellowship, a very prestigious fellowship here after that, then went to Irvine for a couple of years for additional postdoctoral research before he joined the faculty here a year and a half ago. He works on 
galaxy evolution and how uh, dark matter and chemical evolution in those galaxies uh, plays a role in, in, in many of the things he's going to talk about tonight. So, so please welcome Evan Kirby. Thanks very much, Cameron. Who's excited about gravitational waves? Who was at the press release last Thursday? Was that awesome or what? Well, I'm not going to talk about that at all. <laughs> but you are going to hear about that panel later. But I am going to get you excited about something. I'm going to get you excited about dwarf galaxies. Now, ordinarily, that doesn't sound like it would be that exciting. Just a little tiny galaxy. What's the big deal? Well, to show you what the big deal is, I'm going to take you on an archaeological road trip with the Keck telescopes. And this road trip is going to take us to the outskirts of our own Milky Way galaxy. We're going to go to the suburbs. Now, again, that doesn't sound very exciting, but I'm going to show you why it's exciting to go to the suburbs of the Milky Way. This is one of the most beautiful dwarf galaxies. This is called the Small Magellanic Clouds. Who's been to the Southern Hemisphere? Who's been to a dark site in the Southern Hemisphere? Who has seen this thing in the sky? This is, the, this is one of the only two dwarf galaxies in the sky that you can see with your naked eye. The other one being the uncreatively called Large Magellanic Cloud. Now, this is not a typical dwarf galaxy. This is one of the brightest dwarf galaxies that I can think of. And because it's not a typical dwarf galaxy, it's beautiful. It's beautiful because it has these blue glowing clouds of gas. It has these dust lanes going through it. It's just gorgeous. But the more typical dwarf galaxy is, I'm just going to say, it's ugly. It's not so beautiful. It's actually one of these things. It's just a big ball of stars. It's not, it doesn't look like there's that much going on in it. At least there's not much going on in it now. But at one time, this galaxy used to look a lot more beautiful. It used to look a lot more like that small Magellanic cloud. There was a lot of stuff going on in it. It had these glowing clouds of gas. It had the dust lanes. It had stars being formed right before our very eyes. But today, it doesn't look like that anymore because it's dead, and it's been dead for a long time, for well over a billion years. But even Fornax is not the most typical of dwarf galaxies because it's one of the larger of the dwarf galaxies of the Milky Way, not quite as large as the Small Magellanic Cloud, but still pretty large. An even more typical dwarf galaxy is this one, Ursa Minor. And it's so, so dwarfy and hard to see that if you're staring right at it, you kind of have to be told that the dwarf galaxy is sort of in this region, sort of running from the bottom right to the upper left there. So that's how small these galaxies are. They're so small that they're hard to see even when you're looking right at them. But I assure you, there is a galaxy sitting right there in this image. To give you a sense of size for how big these galaxies are, I'm going to establish a conversion rate. You can think of this as sort of like a currency conversion, you know, between like euros and dollars. Well, here we're going to establish a conversion rate between stars and people. That's our currency conversion rate. If the Milky Way has 50 billion stars, which it does. The Milky Way has about 50 billion stars. And New York City has about 8.2 million people. You can get a rough idea of my conversion rate between stars and people. So I'm equating one of the largest cities in the United States with the Milky Way galaxy. Fornax, that sort of largest dwarf galaxy that I showed you on the previous slide, has only 19 million stars in it. So to put that in perspective, if the Milky Way is New York City, then Fornax is this town in Pennsylvania called Strasbourg. Who's ever been to Strasbourg? I didn't think so. All right. Ursa Minor, on the other hand, is someplace in the middle of nowhere, Montana, with only 92 people. Ursa Minor has only 560,000 stars, so we're well beyond the suburbs at this point. We're in the middle of nowhere, Montana. I apologize if you're from the middle of nowhere, Montana, but... I've given this talk a few times, and I haven't insulted anyone yet. Now, these dwarf galaxies, as I mentioned, they were at one time really beautiful. They were much like the small Magellanic Cloud looks today. They were forming stars. They were having these beautiful glowing clouds of gas. Whenever you see those beautiful glowing clouds of gas, what you're looking at is this process of stellar birth. It's a very beautiful process. And so what these dwarf galaxies were doing were making those stars one at a time, very lovingly handcrafted stars these dwarf galaxies were making just one at a time. So at one time, these dwarf galaxies were small little factories. You can think of them as like artisanal factories for making handmade stars one at a time. And the way they made these stars uh, was they had some low-mass stars being formed, little kind of baby stars, and also really big stars. And the really big stars were in, a, in themselves factories. They were factories for the elements of the periodic table. Every time you have one of these really massive stars, at the end of its life, it exploded in a very violent process that just took a matter of seconds. 
In this very violent process, elements were fused together to make heavier elements on the periodic table. And people make models of these stars, very smart hydrodynamical theorists who study these supernova explosions, make models of them to see how the elements in the periodic table were created. So in this particular model, you saw an explosion happen near the center of that star. And that explosion was punching its way through the surface of the star. And once it reached the surface, it kind of exploded outward like this. So it looks a lot like a nuclear explosion that you might have seen a uh, video from when we were doing nuclear explosion tests decades ago. And that's because this is a nuclear explosion. This is how elements are formed, uh, the heavier elements in the periodic table. They're formed in the explosion of massive stars. And so these dwarf galaxies were at one time making quite a few of these stars in different regions of them all at once. And so other uh, very smart theorists like my friend John Wise from Georgia Tech here make simulations of entire galaxies. So right now what we're looking at is just a cloud of gas. That's how one of these dwarf galaxies started out. But notice now at the center of this galaxy, a supernova has just exploded. What you're seeing is this gas from the supernova being expelled outwards into the other parts of the galaxy. Now the gas in this simulation is color-coded according to the element uh, that is responsible for causing the gas to glow. So all that red gas there, that corresponds to hydrogen gas. The universe, and, and hence these dwarf galaxies, started off with just nothing but a bunch of hydrogen and helium. And so that hydrogen was glowing red. But when that first supernova blew up, it made some of the heavier elements on the periodic table, including oxygen and sulfur. And so you see this oxygen glowing blue here, and the sulfur is glowing green. Now, one of the really cool things about this simulation is that a lot of times when you look at these simulations, they're kind of color-coded with a rainbow or some fakey color set. This particular simulation, John had the foresight to process the light of this simulation through red, green, and blue filters to present the galaxy as we would see it with our naked eye. So if we were looking at this galaxy as it was doing this stuff, as it was blowing up these stars, this is actually how we would see it. So this is a very visceral way to see the process of chemical evolution in a galaxy happen. Now, unfortunately, this simulation took many hundreds of millions of years uh, to process through. That was what this simulation was doing. It was looking at a galaxy's lifetime over hundreds of millions of years. And unfortunately, uh, my tenure time scale is only six years, so I don't really have time to watch this hundreds of millions of year galaxy evolution process in action. And if you noticed, John had made this simulation rotate a little bit like this. You see how the galaxy is rotating like this because our perspective is rotating. And we haven't yet invented telescopes that can rotate around other galaxies yet. So for now, we have to keep those inside of the computer. Uh, but what I can do is figure out what observed dwarf galaxies were doing in the past. And I can look at simulations like John's here and I could say, does this simulation look like what I actually observed in the galaxies? The simulations are especially useful because I mentioned these dwarf galaxies were once turning gas into stars, and those stars were once turning hydrogen and helium into the heavier elements of the periodic table, but they're not doing that anymore. These galaxies are now dead. The factories are dead. The foreman has sent all of the workers home. It's like, we're done, we're closed, that's it. We're fired. Everyone's fired. So all of the stars, every star that has formed, it can stay there, but there's no new stars being formed. There's no more supernova blowing up. There's no more heavier elements of the periodic table being formed. So then how can we hope to study anything about this process of galaxy evolution if the galaxies are dead now? Well, it's the same way we study dead civilizations here on the Earth. We use archaeology. We can use the evidence that we see right in front of us today to figure out what these galaxies were doing in the past. So this is actually a field, a subfield of astronomy called galactic archaeology. So what we're doing right now is we're looking at an archaeological site here on the Earth. And this archaeological site you see has some walls that are now all decrepit and torn down and there's no people there anymore, but there's evidence at this archaeological site for what these people used to be doing. So maybe I take a stroll through this site and I pick up a pottery shard. And the pottery shard's in my hand and I can look at it from different angles. I see that maybe it's colored red. I could, I could even lick it. I say, hmm, it tastes like wine. This, this, this civilization, these are people who clearly were growing grapes and making wine. Or maybe it tastes like olive oil, so I can figure out that they were an agrarian society and they knew how to grow olive trees uh, and uh, smash olives to make olive oil. So I can learn a lot 
about this civilization, even though there's no people left, just by taking a stroll through the site and picking up the archaeological evidence that's there. Now, I also have access to some archaeological tools or archaeological sites, and the archaeological sites I have access to are galaxies very far away. Now, a terrestrial archaeologist has the advantage of being able to walk to a site and pick up things off the ground and then put them through a mass spectrometer or something like that. I, however, am confined to the Earth. I can't take a visit to one of these galaxies. So I have very different tools for being an archaeologist. So these are terrestrial archaeologist tools, brushes, hammers, chisels. But my tools are quite different. They're the Keck telescopes. These are the twin 10-meter telescopes on the summit of Mauna Kea in Hawaii. These are the best telescopes in the world, and no, I'm not biased about that. Caltech has... Uh, um, quite a lot of investment in the Keck telescopes. These are amazing feats of engineering, and I really owe my career to these things. Now, the things that the Keck telescope does tell us about are the compositions of the stars that are still surviving today. So these tools that I'm using are not tools like hammers and chisels. They're actually light. The only thing that I can collect from these stars are the light that is pouring from them. And the Keck telescope is so sensitively tuned that it can pick up light from stars that are very, very far away and intrinsically quite faint. And so when we split up the starlight into its constituent colors, this is what we get. This is called the stellar spectrum. And I can split up the light so finely that I can tell not only how much blue light and red light there is in the star, but how much of this very exact shade of blue and this very exact shade of blue and this ever so slightly different shade of blue. And what this tells me a lot about is what the star is made of. Like, for example, I'm looking at these three uh, chunks of green light that have been removed from the spectrum of this star. There's a certain something that's removing those chunks of light from the spectrum of that star, and that certain something is the atom of magnesium. So we, just by looking at the spectrum of this star, I know that it has a lot of magnesium in it. Does anybody have a guess about which star this is a spectrum of? What's your favorite star? Yes. That's a very good guess. It's a very good guess. You guessed Arcturus, which is a red giant. It's actually not. It's actually even more favorite of a star. I guarantee you like this star better than you like Arcturus. The sun. It is the sun. Good. Very good. This is a spectrum of our own sun. And because I can see these three chunks of green taken out, I know there's magnesium. Because there's a chunk of red taken out up there, I know there's hydrogen in the sun. So all the different chunks of light taken out tell me about all the different elements in the periodic table that are present in this particular star, the sun. Now, one of the awesome things about the Keck telescope are all the various instruments you can put behind it. As you might know, we don't go to telescopes and put our eye up to them and look through them and see what, is, what the light of the stars looks like. We have very exquisite, very sensitively tuned instruments to figure out what the light of the stars uh, is actually characterized as. The, one of the most awesome instruments on Keck is called the DEMO spectrograph. DEMO stands for the Deep Extragalactic Imaging Multi-Object Spectrograph. And the most important part of that is the multi-object spectrograph. So the telescope time on Keck is very precious. There's a rule at the Keck telescope which is to keep the shutter open all the time. And if I can maximize the efficiency of the Keck telescope by opening the shutter all the time, not only collecting the light of one star, but collecting the light of many different stars in the same galaxy, then I'm doing a good job at Keck. And so that's what this multi-object spectrograph does for me. It allows me to take the spectra of hundreds of stars all at one shot, all at the same time. Now, this all sounds very fancy, but really what the DEMO spectrograph is is just a big digital camera. So you probably have a digital camera in your cell phone like this. Well, the DEMO spectrograph is just one giant digital camera, and this is what it looks like. So you can't carry it around in your pocket, as you can tell. It's actually about the size of a small school bus. But this thing is an amazing piece of engineering. There's little pixels inside of the DEMO spectrograph, just like there's pixels in your cell phone camera, except there's 64 million of them. It's a 64 megapixel camera. What's even worse is that this whole apparatus has to rotate over the course of the night because the sky is moving overhead and in order for the picture to stay steady, the entire spectrograph has to rotate like this over the course of the night. This piece of engineering is so exquisite that a speck of light will stay on one pixel. In fact, it'll stay within one-tenth of a pixel 
over a full 180 degree rotation from one end of the sky to the other. The pixels are only 24 microns big. So one speck of light stays within the same two micron space on this detector over a full 180 degree rotation. That's how exquisitely engineered this instrument is. But like I mentioned, it's really just a big camera. It's a 64 megapixel camera. This is what one of the pictures from Deimos looks like. And all of these horizontal lines you see, that's a spectrum of a different star in the same galaxy. In fact, this is a spectrum, this is a bunch of spectra actually in a globular cluster, not a dwarf galaxy, but it's a similar concept. So every one of these things is telling me about the composition of a different star in this globular cluster. So to examine this a little bit more, let me zoom in on this 64 megapixel image. Now you can see a little bit more detail. You see that there's really just a whole bunch of these horizontal lines, each one corresponding to the spectrum of a different star. I can zoom in a little bit more and a little bit more. And now we're actually seeing individual stars one by one very clearly. In some cases, you can see that the light of stars has been removed. As you can see, there's a little bit of a chunk of light taken out there. That's telling me something about the composition of this star. But the dominant feature that you really see are all these vertical lines. And these vertical lines are actually not part of this galaxy at all. That's actually our Earth's atmosphere. So one of the penalties we have to pay by being the Earth-bound astronomers is having to deal with the Earth itself. And so uh, this is actually a nuisance. It would be much preferable if we could just put the Keck telescope in space and have it observed from there. But instead, we have to look through the atmosphere and deal with all of these pesky uh, emission lines that are present from the Earth's atmosphere. So one of the other cool things about uh, this uh, spectrograph is all the awesome software that comes with it that allows me to just get rid of all of the Earth. So I can just pretend like the Earth doesn't exist. And I'm left with a spectra of the stars alone and the stars by themselves. Don't have to deal with the Earth anymore. In reality, I don't really look at the spectra like this. Instead, what I do is I take the flux or the amount of intensity of light at each different pixel here and I plot it versus the wavelength of light. And what the wavelength of light is telling me is how red or how blue is the light. So this light is pretty red, but this light is even redder, and this light is even redder. So I can see that at very specific wavelengths corresponding to very specific colors in the star, some light is missing. So before I pointed out three different chunks of light taken out of the spectrum of the sun corresponding to magnesium. These are three chunks of light taken out of the spectrum of these stars corresponding to the element calcium. So just by seeing these three dips in this spectrum of these stars, I know that these stars have some calcium in them. And the strength of these dips tells me exactly how much calcium is in these stars. So if even more light was taken out of these wavelengths, then I know that the star would have even more calcium in it. And it's not just magnesium and calcium. It's a whole plethora of elements that I can measure in these stars. This is what the full spectrum looks like. And you can see that there's lots of chunks of light taken out everywhere. Every little dip down uh, in these spectra tells me something about the amount of different elements in the periodic table in these stars. In fact, I can color code each region of the spectrum or each color in the spectrum based on which element is responsible for the absorption. So you can see there's lots and lots of pink regions here, which means that there's lots and lots of absorption lines due to the element iron. Fe is the chemical symbol for iron. There's also lots and lots of absorption lines due to magnesium, silicon, calcium, titanium, and most of the other elements on the periodic table. So really what I'm gathering from the Keck telescope is information about what these stars are made of. Just like when I went to the archaeological site in Haifa and I picked up something and I licked it, essentially I'm licking these stars to figure out what they're made of. But I'm not licking them with my tongue, I'm licking them with the light, the spectra that come out of them. So what does this tell me about? It tells me about the periodic table. Which of these elements are present in the star and in which quantities? So the periodic table is very complex. You can see there's well over 100 elements present here on the periodic table. But let me tell you a dirty secret about astronomy. This dirty secret is that we're pretty imprecise as astronomers. When we talk about distances, we really only know the distances of things to plus or minus about 30%. We talk about what stars are made of. I really only can tell you to first order, uh, does it have hydrogen, does it have helium, or does it have anything else? So I kid you not, I kid you not, to astronomers, everything that's heavier than helium is called a metal. Oxygen, that's a metal. Neon, that's a metal. I don't care that it's a gas, it's still a metal. 
This is not exactly true. I mean, a lot of astronomers, uh, especially these higher redshift astronomers, people who are talking about things that are at the distance of that gravitational wave, those, bi binary, uh, those binary black holes, all they can really tell you about is it hydrogen, helium, or something else. But with the DEMOS spectrograph, with these individual stellar spectra, I can be a little bit more precise. And these are the elements that I can measure with the DEMOS spectrograph. I can tell you how much hydrogen, magnesium, silicon, calcium, titanium, and iron there are in these stars. And what's most important to point out here is I can tell you if it's one of these four elements, magnesium, silicon, calcium, titanium, or if it's iron. And the reason it's important to make that distinction is that iron comes from a very different site in the universe than these other four elements. All of these elements are forged in massive stars, either when the star was burning and having a productive life, or when the star was dying and exploding. And in particular, when the star was burning and having a productive life, it made some of the lighter elements, like magnesium and silicon. But when the star was dying and exploding in a supernova, it was making a bunch of iron. So the ratio of magnesium to iron, for example, can tell me a lot about what these galaxies were doing. What kind of stars were they making? What kind of supernova were exploding? So let me show you one little plot here. I hope you forgive me if I show you a plot with x and y axes, but I'm sure we can handle it. So what I'm showing you here on the y-axis is the ratio of elements like magnesium and silicon, which I'm calling alpha, to iron. So lighter elements compared to heavier elements. If the, if the y-axis is showing a high value, it means there's a lot of magnesium, not so much iron. If the y-axis is showing a low value, it means there's a lot of iron, not so much magnesium. The x-axis here is a measure of how much iron is in the star. So what I'm going to walk you through now is a little bit of history of dwarf galaxies. Very, very early on in dwarf galaxies, they only experienced a certain type of supernova. And a certain type of supernova pow, when it blows up, it makes a bunch of magnesium. So I'm going to call it a magnesium supernova. So when this magnesium supernova blows up, it makes a lot of magnesium and not so much iron. So the ratio of alpha to iron or magnesium to iron is quite high. But then after a certain amount of time, there's a supernova that takes a little bit of care, a little bit of work to make happen. And that little bit of work to make happen takes time. So after enough magnesium and enough iron have been created in the galaxy, then we can get to a different type of supernova, an iron supernova. Kaboom! This iron supernova I like to call an F-bomb. It's actually an F-E-bomb. F-E is the chemical symbol for iron, so it's a F-bomb. So these iron bombs make a whole bunch of iron in the galaxy, which depresses the alpha to iron ratio. So there's not any magnesium coming out of these supernova, but there is a whole bunch of iron. And so what I'm showing you here is sort of a track in a galaxy's lifetime. And where a galaxy lives on this track can tell me about exactly how far along it was in its own chemical evolution. And so when I measure the chemical compositions of stars in these galaxies, what I'm trying to do is place them along this track to see how evolved the galaxies were. And this is really the essence of galactic archaeology, to figure out how the galaxies were forming stars, how rapidly they were forming stars, how efficiently they were forming stars. Were they good factory workers or were they lazy factory workers? And that's really what I'm doing here. Now, before I conclude, I want to show you a very special galaxy. It's a galaxy that's barely there. It's called Segway 1. It has kind of an unusual name. Segway is actually an acronym for the survey that found the galaxy. The Sloan, Extra -Galactic, uh, under the Sloan Exploration for Galactic Understanding and Evolution, or something like that. Uh, astronomers are kind of uncreative, and so the first galaxy that was found in the Segway survey was called Segway 1. They probably should have called it something more dramatic, but they called it Segway 1. Now, when you were looking at Ursa Minor on the first slide of this presentation, you were staring right at the galaxy, but you didn't know it was there. This is an even worse example of that. You're really looking directly at the Segway 1 galaxy. And in fact, the Segway 1 galaxy is filling this image. It's not like this little thing right here. It's the entire image. You're looking at this thing, and you're like, huh? It really looks just like a blank star field to me. And that's because there are so few stars in Segway 1 that all of the foreground stuff and the background stuff is dominating your vision here. So remember before I mentioned that one of the penalties of being a terrestrial astronomer is that we have to look through the Earth's atmosphere? Well, there's also a penalty with being an astronomer who lives in the Milky Way. In order to look out of the Milky Way at other galaxies, we have to look through the Milky Way. 
And the Milky Way is composed of a whole bunch of stars. And so to look at galaxies beyond the Milky Way, we have to look through that field of stars. And so because the Segway 1 galaxy is so ridiculously small, we don't really see it because we have all the other Milky Way stuff in the foreground. And that's really what our eye is drawn to. So let me do you a favor. I'm going to circle all of the stars that we know about that exist in the Segway 1 dwarf galaxy. There are 25 circles on this diagram. These are the only 25 stars that we know about that belong to an entire galaxy. Remember, the Milky Way galaxy had 50 billion stars. This galaxy probably has an order of 300 stars, but we only know about 25 of them. That's the entire Segway 1 dwarf galaxy. I'm going to get rid of all the foreground stuff, all the junk in the Milky Way, and that's what the Segway 1 galaxy looks like. This is the smallest example of a dwarf galaxy that we know about so far. To put it in perspective, remember our conversion rate between stars and people? The Milky Way galaxy has 50 billion stars. New York City has 8.2 million people. Well, Segway 1 only has a few hundred stars, so it's about 0.1 of a person. So it's really only like tenth of a person. It's like my leg. That's how tiny the Segway 1 dwarf galaxy is. So galaxy evolution is really an amazing process. We can make galaxies as huge as the Milky Way, 50 billion stars, or galaxies as puny as Segway 1 with fewer than 1,000 stars. So in summary, I've shown you that galaxies manufacture chemical elements, and they do so through little factories called supernova. The Keck telescopes can dig up the composition just like an archaeologist would dig up evidence of what, these, what the different civilizations on the Earth were doing, I use the Keck telescopes to dig up evidence for what these galaxies were doing a long time ago. And the technique that I use is called spectroscopy. I split up the light of the star into its individual colors, and the amount of each color can tell me about the amount of each element in the periodic table. The compositions of those stars can tell me about how quickly or efficiently these galaxies were forming stars. Were the galaxies good factories or were they lazy factories? Was the foreman very good at getting his workers to do the right thing or not so good? And finally, I showed you a little tiny dwarf galaxy, Segway 1, which just shows you that all galaxies come in all kinds of sizes, from 50 billion stars of the Milky Way to even more massive than that to way, way less massive than that. Segway 1 is 1 50 millionth the size of the Milky Way. So thanks for your attention, and I'll be happy to take questions. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, <laughs> That's an excellent analogy, and in, in fact, yes, there is. There is uh, not a particularly strong correlation, but there is a noticeable correlation between the size of a galaxy, and here when I say a size, I mean the number of stars that it has, and how efficient it was at making those stars. So that evidence that I was showing you before, particularly the magnesium to iron ratio, can tell me a lot about how efficient these galaxies were. And from that magnesium to iron ratio, I know that the larger galaxies, the ones with more stars, were quite a bit more efficient at forming those stars than smaller galaxies. And that's, ex in fact, exactly why they were able to have so many stars. The galaxies that were efficient at forming stars formed more stars. Yes, miss. So what are stars made of? Stars are made mostly of the element hydrogen. Hydrogen is the lightest element on the periodic table. It's just one proton and one electron. It's not the only thing stars are made of, thankfully, because like I showed you this uh, spectrum of the sun here, the sun has all kinds of stuff in it. It's just like when you're cooking something on the stove and you throw in a little bit of pepper and a little bit of salt, there's a little bit of pepper and salt in the sun too. There's sodium, there's chlorine, and whatever pepper is made up as well. Yes? Excellent question. Because, you know, if you're looking at this image, you would say, wait a minute, there's nothing there. You're, I kind of lost my mind. There's absolutely nothing there. How can I tell you that there's a dwarf galaxy there? Well, this is a monochromatic image. If I were to show you a color image of this particular field of the sky, then all of the stars that I circled in Segway 1 would have slightly different colors from the foreground stars in the Milky Way. In fact, they'd be a little bit bluer. And so what we do is we make... Uh, catalogs of different spots in the sky. And we look at only the stars that have the right color to be members of these dwarf galaxies. And so by saying that, you know, okay, this star doesn't have the right color, we cut it out. This star doesn't have the right color, we cut it out. 
we can look for overdensities of stars that have the exact right color to be members of these dwarf galaxies. And so by looking at this in a different way, the dwarf galaxies can pop out a little bit more. Even so, once we identify them in that method, they're only candidates. They're only candidate dwarf galaxies. And the way we really confirm their presence as a dwarf galaxy is to take spectra of the stars like I did with the Keck Demo spectrograph. Uh, one of the other things that I didn't mention that the spectra can tell you about, about is how fast the stars are moving. If the stars all belong to the same galaxy, they should be moving together. So if I figured out how fast all these stars are moving, they'd have all random velocities except for the Segway 1 stars. They'd be all be moving together with each other. Yes, sir? That's okay, no problem. You can ask me later. Yes? Um, is it just a difference of scale? Uh, how, how would uh, the population of stars in broader clusters relate to the population of stars in the world that's a, that's a really, really pertinent question. In fact, there was a paper written in 2012 with the simplest title I know about. It was called Galaxy, Comma, Defined. And the whole purpose of that paper was to figure out, well, how do we know that these things aren't just globular clusters? Because, in fact, globular clusters have 50,000, 100,000 stars associated with them. Globular clusters can have a lot more stars in some of these galaxies. The real distinguishing characteristic between a globular cluster and a dwarf galaxy is the presence of dark matter. Globular clusters don't have dark matter in them, whereas these galaxies like Segway 1 do have dark matter in them. And we know that Segway 1 has dark matter in it because, remember I mentioned I can measure the velocities of the stars? The velocities of the stars are a direct measurement of the mass of the entire galaxy. And the velocities of the stars indicate a mass that's far in excess of what you could possibly get from the stars alone. So I know that Segway 1 has tons and tons of dark matter in it, whereas globular clusters have masses that are completely consistent with just coming from their stars. Yeah, follow-up. No, no, it's just, you've had a follow-up question. You mentioned that the stars that you found that belong to Segway 1 were blue. Does that kind of suggest the young, hotter stars as opposed to much older, cooler stars? Or is it, is it a question of uh, uh, a shift in, in uh, favorite spectrum because of the acceleration towards us? What, what, what yields the blue color? That's a great question as well. So it turns out that all of the stars in Segway 1 have about the same age. but what the blue stars are, are some of the most massive stars that haven't yet become red giants yet. So there's a few red giants in Segway 1, but most of the stars, the, most of the brightest stars, are the ones that are just about to become red giants. And right before a star becomes a red giant, it's quite blue. And so those blue stars, there's quite a lot of those blue stars that are just waiting to be red giants. And so seeing an overdensity of those blue stars is how we find them. Yes, sir? That's an excellent question. Are stars made out of gas or are they made out of plasma? Well, a plasma is a type of gas. It's a type of gas where the electrons have been removed from the atoms. And it so happens that different parts of the stars have gas where the electrons have been removed, but the outermost parts of the stars have gas where the electrons haven't been removed. So my answer to your question is both. One more question. Yes, sir. That is an excellent question. So does the size of the galaxy determine the size of the individual stars? I will say yes, but it's only a coincidence that it does that because the smaller the galaxy, the older the galaxy. And the older the galaxy, the less likely it is to have stars that are very massive because very massive stars don't live very long at all. And so all the massive stars in Segway 1 have died a long time ago. So because Segway 1 is old, it doesn't have massive stars. But also, because the way one is small, it happens to be old because of this correlation between the size and the ages of galaxies. Thanks, everyone. All right. Everyone who stuck around for the, the informal panel discussion on gravitational waves, uh, we have three representatives of the community here. Um, our first is Dr. Jamie Rollins, who's working on the LIGO team here at Caltech. The, the people who just made the amazing discovery and announcement last week. Uh, Dr. Chiara Mingarelli, who is a, 
involved in pulsar timing rays and the nanograv team, uh, which is another method for detecting, detecting gravitational waves in a different frequency range. And Dr. Leo Stein, uh, who is primarily a theorist, who works on a variety of different topics, including gravitational waves. So, and who used to work for LIGO? And who used to work for LIGO when he was an undergraduate here, is that right? Yeah, both. Both? As an undergrad here and as a grad student for the first two years. You can't escape it. I was also a member of LIGO for a few years. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so uh, I guess we'll just open it up to, to you guys if you guys have any particular questions or do you, do you guys want to. I don't know. I don't know how to do this. I didn't really plan this that well. So. Who, who, here, who here heard about the, the announcement on Thursday? It was pretty big news, I think. All right, good. So every, everybody knows what's going on. But I think we should just go straight with questions. Go for it. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, the deep noise and approaches? Right. Right. Yeah, that's a very, that's the, in some sense, that's kind of the most important question. So he's asking about denoising, but it's, you know, eliminating the noise sources in the instrument of LIGO that might mask the gravitational wave signal. And so we, we've, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out what all those noise sources would be and um, so that we could, you know, appropriately figure out all the ways to uh, isolate the detector from those noises. So in some sense, I like to think about LIGO as in fact a giant, it's less an less a instrument in and of itself than it is a shield of the test masses from the from everything else. So we basically try to m make the test masses be as shielded as possible from all other, you know, forces on the Earth. And so the, the basically the major noise sources that we have to contend with, primarily <coughs> the number one one is seismic noise. So we're, we build this detector on the surface of the Earth and the surface of the Earth moves around a lot. And so we have to do a lot of work to isolate the detector from ground motion. So probably the most, one of the most complicated systems in LIGO is the seismic isolation system. All of the test masses are hung from pendulum, pendula, which isolate from the ground, and those pendula are hung from seismic isolation tables, and all of that's in, the vac in a vacuum system, and it's all to isolate LIGO from the ground noise. That's the first thing. Then we have, once you get rid of that noise, you start to get into m more exotic stuff. Um, one is that there's a noise, do you guys remember how the, the distances we're trying to detect here, right? 10 to the minus 19 meters, which is just an unfathomably small number. And so if you think about... It's about the thousandth the diameter of yeah, a thousandth the diameter of an atom. And so when you think about it, we're trying to, to detect that motion with a mirror, with a macroscopic object. And so the surface of that mirror is going to be moving around much, much more than that, just because it's got thermal heat in it, because it's at room temperature, it's not at absolute zero. So the atoms are all vibrating around. So that's a really important noise source, is just the thermal motion of the atoms in the mirrors. So we designed special mirrors to try to, um, it's, hard to e it's hard to even describe in an intuitive way how, how we try to basically make all the motion of those atoms be at one frequency. So we can sort of know where it's all happening and then kind of you know, it's like you shove, it all the, you shove all the problematic stuff into, into a corner and we just let it sit there and be a problem with a dunce hat on and then look, you know, everywhere else where, where we think that the, the, where we don't see that motion. Can you describe what one of these mirrors looks like? How big it yeah, so the mirrors are about this big around, roughly, something like this. And the laser beam spot on it is something like this big in the middle of it. And so... 
that's the, the, the fact that we make the laser beam really as big as we possibly can is another thing that helps this, this, this issue that we can average over a large number of atoms so that the motion of one individual atom isn't such a problem and we can average it out over all the motion and on, on the whole when we average it out it's pretty, pretty smooth. And then the last noise source which is kind of one of the um, most interesting, well they're all interesting, but the one that's, that's sort of uh, exotic is the fact that light itself is a quantum mechanical thing. So the light, the laser light that we're using to measure the distance in the arms that's, that's probing this, this space-time fluctuation is a quantum mechanical thing. So it's both, you know, you hear about how light's both a, a particle and a wave. So that the particle nature of light is such that, you know, instead of getting a, a sort of smooth uh, flux of light that hits the mirrors, we actually get, it's like rain, it's each, each particle of light hits the mirror at a different time and that causes this like rain sound noise that um, we have to deal with and one of the ways we can improve that noise is by increasing the power, the laser power. So it's, it, again it's another averaging effect. So if we can increase the laser power we have more atoms and then that noise kind of averages out as we, as we add more atom, uh, more so the, uh, photons. So the trade-off, right, though, because if you increase the power in the laser, then you tend to heat up your mirrors, which causes more there's, noise. Right, so, well, there's, the, there's, two, there's two effects. You, you increase the power, you heat the mirrors, which causes, you know, Distortion. distortions in the optics, and it also, the, yeah, I, I, I didn't really fully explain it accurately. It's hard to get into the subtlety, but the, that, 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 fot that what we call photon counting noise is a is a is a um, an effect that manifests when we detect the light, and then there's a similar effect of the sort of the converse effect of that is the light banging on the mirror and causing the mirror to move around, and that's a quantum mechanical noise that we have to contend with as well. So it, it gets pretty pretty tricky. But the instrument gets some Mm-hmm. So, we're, so we're, we're trying to measure 10 to the mi a difference of 10 to the minus 19 meters. The wavelength of the light is about one micron, so that's 10 to the minus 6 meters. So that's 10 to the minus 13th of a wavelength. So it's, it's a very, very small, small, tiny, tiny deviation of the wavelength of light that we're looking for. Yeah. Right. Right. So the right. So we we, we want to make the arms longer, such that when the gravitational wave goes through the detector, that that strain effect causes you know the photon has to the longer we make it, the more distance the photon has to travel for a given strain. So it ampli it essentially amplifies the effect. The longer we can make the arms. The longer, the more amplification of that strain effect we get. And we do something similar where we, we, we put, we, we actually bounce the light back and forth in the arm hundreds of times, so that, that that's again a, a amplifies the effect by the, the number of bounces. Right. The, Right. So the, this, this, the gravitational wave is traveling at the speed of light, but the frequency of the gravitational wave that we're looking for is actually very, lo it's low frequency. So it's, we're looking for audio frequency waves, you know, you can, you can listen to the sound of the wave. So that means that the wavelength of the gravitational wave that's passing through the instrument is many miles long. So that, you know, so you have this oscillation that happens over, you know, the course of the, the you know, a, a longer time. Yeah. 
Yeah. A hundredth of a second. Every hundredth of a second, the distance. Every hundredth of a second, the distance changes. Um, so. There, you can kind of think of it like every hundredth of a second, a little bit of light spills out of the arms. So it's not that every photon has to do the trip the whole time. It's just that because the distance is changing every hundredth of a second, the light that's been building up in the arms is a little bit unbalanced by the time it gets to the beam splitter, and some of it ends up spilling out. Is that right? Yeah. I'm just going to gonna pause for a moment. Uh, We'll take a, a two-minute rest so people can leave if they need to, go out to the telescopes or use the bathroom or whatever, just so people are comfortable instead of you get stuck here and you're like, I gotta get out of here. But these people are still I think so. I would say people can free to come know, and go as you please. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're not hurt if you get up and Yeah, that's right. <laughs> So you were just talking about the, the, the frequency of these experiments, and I think I can just take this one opportunity to plug pulsar timing arrays. Yeah, yeah, so pulsar timing arrays uh, are actually galactic scale gravitational wave detectors, and so our sources are supermassive black hole binaries instead of stellar mass or you know tens of times the mass of the sun binaries uh, black holes. And so these uh, supermassive black holes live in the centers of galaxies, and when galaxies merge, their central supermassive black holes merge. Now, uh, whereas LIGO can hear gravitational waves that are in the audible human ear range, so tens of hertz to a kilohertz, pulsar timing arrays are sensitive to the nanohertz frequency spectrum, so 1 to 100 nanohertz, where nano is 10 to the minus 9, or a billionth of a hertz. And so when you're staying long, that's pretty funny, because <laughs> the, our frequencies, right, um, take a, you know, our wavelengths would take about 10 years to pass through uh, the Earth. And so these are very, very, very long wavelengths. But the way, the way what I like to think about for the pulsar timing arrays is that you guys are detectors where the length of your arm is essentially the distance from us to the pulsar. Exactly. And so, we have, and that's we have 40, we're like a LIGO, so it's like around a kiloparsec or 3,000 light years. And so, so, imagine, yeah, so imagine a LIGO detector where the length of the arm is light years long instead yeah, of just two, yeah, yeah. So instead of four kilometers. Exactly. And it's, it's really cool because it's like a LIGO detector, but you have, you know, 40 of them all around you right now. And you're, we're like spiders that are sitting in the middle of our spider webs. And the pulsars are like all of these different places around us. And we have like these little threads connecting us to the pulsars. And when the webs jiggle, right, we can sense that a gravitational wave is going through it. And so this is another way of looking for gravitational waves, but also from different sources. So whereas LIGO can see neutron star mergers or black hole mergers that are only a few times the mass of the sun, we see supermassive black hole binaries. And we can also see more exotic cosmological sources like cosmic string kinks and cusps, and even primordial gravitational waves, depending on whether or not you believe in inflation. So I just wanted to plug that. We, we had a, there was a lot of friendly competition between LIGO and these pulsar timing people about who was going to detect the gravitational waves first. Well, not for me. I mean, I think I, I always said that whoever detects gravitational waves is going to be a hero because then we'll all have jobs. That's, that's right. <laughs> that's all good. Let's take some more questions. Yeah. So, uh, as you improve your instrumentation, are you thinking of replacing the laser with something else like X-ray or...? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. So, yeah, we're constantly thinking about, I mean, a lot of us, the, the instrumental folks, we, we live right across the street over there, and we, we, we've been spending a lot of our time recently, now that this, well, we're still trying, we haven't made this instrument as good as we wanted to, so we're, there's still work to make on this one, but we there's still work to be done on this one. But yes, we're thinking ahead to what can we, how can we improve it? And so we think about how we can improve the, the laser. And we, we do think about moving to different frequencies of light, but the, it's, we're, we're more constrained by uh, more technical, technical issues having to do with um, what light is best for um, 
for, for instance, for that thermal noise problem I was talking about in the test masses. So we want to think of better materials to make the test masses out of. And so if we, we, we come up with a better material for the test mass, that might require that we move to a different frequency of light because the, the test masses need to be translucent to light. It's kind of a weird counterintuitive thing. But remember, the, we use these light cavities in order to build up the amount of power in the arms. And so the light needs to be able to go through the mirror, the mirror substrate, and then reflect off of just the surface of it. So in some sense, the, what the mirror is made of needs to be translucent so to light. Right, but one of the the Japanese gravitational wave detectors are considering using um, uh, cryogenic mirrors. Well, yeah, not only cryogenic, but also sapphire mirrors. Yeah, they want to use they want to use sapphire, which we used we use what's fused silica, which is basically glass. It's basically the glass similar to the glass that's in windows, but they want to use sapphire, which is a more of a crystalline structure instead of this sort of glass is kind of an amorphous. It doesn't. It's not a crystal structure like, like some other things are. Oh, I'm going to give this to Leo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, That's a good question. So, so uh, the sources that uh, LIGO is interested in are th kinds of things that we already know exist in the unit. Well, there may be things that we haven't thought of yet. That would be very exciting to detect. But the, the, the primary sources that LIGO is interested in are merging black holes and merging neutron stars. And neutron stars are these kind of really, really super dense remnants of massive stars. Um, dark matter, uh, to the best of our understanding, is kind of distributed throughout the galaxy in a pretty uniform way. And what it takes to generate gravitational waves is having some really, really compact, really, really massive things moving, uh, accelerating very rapidly. So that's why we're interested in black holes and neutron stars, because they are the most compact sources that we know about astronomically. But then if you, if you think about how dark matter is distributed th through the galaxy, all of the individual dark matter particles are whizzing around, but it's so uniform that it's kind of just like a, you know, it's just kind of like a fluid that's about the same density everywhere. So everything kind of averages together and we don't expect dark matter to really generate much of a, a gravitational wave signature. Does that answer your question? So they used to one of the things that they used to think that dark matter might be made of are black holes that we don't see. We, you know, black holes we don't see, they don't emit light. So, it's, so there was speculation that maybe dark matter was just a bunch of black holes that we don't see. But I think that's kind of, that's, that's kind of gone out, that theory has kind of gone out of favor for the, the idea that dark matter is composed of more fundamental particles that we don't see. So it's more like what Leo's describing where it's like a, you know, a sort of a continuous fluid of these fundamental particles rather than these really hyper-dense, compact things like black holes. So those had interesting names, right? Machos and Machos wimps, and wimps. <laughs> right? So machos were massive compact halo objects and then WIMPs are weakly interacting massive particles. Yeah, those were the two competing dark matter. So we think that the difference. WIMPs are winning over the machos. The WIMPs are beating the machos. That's, that's how we like it. Yeah. Okay. Just trying to clarify for myself. So all accelerating masses would generate gravity waves? Yes. That's right. Yes. But well, if we were... Not, ex not exactly. I mean, it has to be... It, ha it needs to be a, okay. a you have to be form of... Okay. You can have, I mean, you, if you had a sphere, if you have a sphere, the sphere could be, if the sphere is spinning, that's a, a kind of a, a kind of acceleration. Individual right. Right. 
that does not produce gravitational waves. So spherically symmetric distributions of mass do not produce gravitational waves. But if we were to start do -si doing right now right. and spinning around, we would create gravitational waves. Right. Just you wouldn't detect them. It needs to be not a, not a non-spherical distribution okay. of matter. So the reason you're going after black holes is because they're massive enough to generate the waves in the Is that correct? Yeah, and they also stay together for that final merger Right? So they, they're really compact and they're really hard. You can't really tear a black hole apart. And so you'll get gravitational waves right, right until they merge. And therefore, the signal will get really, really, really strong. Yeah, I mean, one way that I would say is that the, 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 the useful things about black holes is that they're really massive, but they're also really compact. They're, they're the most compact thing, right? So you can't, there, there's nothing that can hold more mass in a smaller area than a black hole. So because of that fact, you can get two black holes, which can both have a lot of mass. You can get them really close to each other, and they can be whizzing around each other really fast, and they emit a lot of gravitational waves. That's why this event was, in some sense, why it was so loud. It's really far away. It's, you know, a billion light years away. But it was a really loud signal in the detector because it's these two really massive black holes, and they really got really close to each other and made a really big burst. Um, could you draw a picture of the waveform that you detected? Sure. <laughs> we just try. had it on a cake this yeah. afternoon. It was I mean, basically, well, I'll try to. It's hard to go wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Qualitative. This is not quantitative. <laughs> Something like that. That's about right. Roughly. Kind of missing the ring down a bit. Well, it's it's I wasn't going to go there. Down. I don't think really we need to. Down. So basically, you have need to do that. sort of a, 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 a lower frequency stuff at the beginning, and then it starts to the amplitude starts to increase, and the frequency starts to de um, increase. increase. So basically, if you look at a time, so this is time, and this is frequency. So it's it's sort of going along like this, and then it goes up in frequency like that. Yeah, I mean, once, it, once the two black holes collide into one thing, it actually, so if you want to, actually, if you wanted to zoom in on it, we kind of think it would do like that for a little bit. And, the, and, and, and then the, the ringing is, is... The ringing, hap the ringing happens at, at, at basically one frequency. But it, then it, it just decays. The amplitude of the ringing decays. So, so black holes like to, they, they have like a natural shape that they want to be. And when two black holes merge into each other, right when they merge, it's really distorted. And the space time itself relaxes and settles down into the shape that it wants to be. So the, the ringing at the end is kind of, is the, the space time itself kind of, shaking itself out and, and, and settling down. And if anyone is really interested in this, Leo and I There's did a, a pod podcast <laughs> on exactly this for titanium physicists, and that's like over an hour long, so we really get you into it. You don't have to listen to the whole thing. Yeah, <laughs> you just have to listen to us. <laughs> uh, maybe in the back, yeah. So shed light on quantum gravity or maybe tests of GR, tests of general relativity, or small deviations? I, mean, I, from I think you're asking about quantum stuff in particular. <laughs> That's what I want to hear from what you're asking. Exactly. So yeah. is, is, that, is there any solution that say that maybe you have to write GR or gravity Well, there's no evidence from this detection that we need to revise GR. Um, but with respect to quantum gravity, do you have some thoughts? So so the kind of naive estimate is that it shouldn't be able to tell you about quantum theories of gravity. And that's because if you calculate, you know, you, you can do the, the back of the envelope calculation for how many gravitons, if, if you think of gravity as being, you know, a quantum theory, how many gravitons would have been released by this merger? 
Uh, that corresponds to something like 10 to the 80, the one with 80 zeros after it, gravitons were released. So the waves that LIGO detected were super, super duper classical, very classical. So that, that sounds kind of pessimistic, like you won't be able to test anything about quantum gravity with gravitational waves. But there are some papers that say maybe you shouldn't be that pessimistic because it's possible if it's the case that quantum effects don't just affect really, really deep inside black holes where curvatures get really huge. If it's the case that, that the whole kind of atmosphere around a black hole, so kind of a region that's the size of the black hole itself, if that region outside of a black hole has quantum effects as well, then that could show up in gravitational waves. The problem is that nobody really has any detailed calculations of why that would be the case. There are some suggestions. It's really highly speculative. But we can kind of do toy calculations where we can imagine how would it affect the gravitational waveform if this was true. It should all be taken with a grain of salt. But at least we have ideas of what kinds of things you can look for if it was true. So just a quick follow-up. So you asked also about tests of general relativity. Um, one of the things that you can test with maybe not this particular detection, but with future detections and even with pulsar timing arrays is different polarizations of gravitational waves. So general relativity predicts that there's a plus and a cross polarization where the plus polarization stretches and squashes space-time like this and then cross goes like this, right? So they're aptly named. Uh, but different uh, alternative theories can have breathing modes, so the gravitational wave goes like this with space-time, and for pulsar timing arrays, this induces different correlation patterns in the time of arrivals from the millisecond pulsars, and you can actually see this uh, effect induced in the pulses which arrive from the pulsars. And so, um, similarly, gravitational waves can tell us different things about alternative theories of gravity. Comment. So, uh, we're, we're actually, we, we were, I was just talking to some colleagues earlier about this exact question, because it's kind of one of the most interesting questions for physicists right now because it's this thing that we really don't understand, this gravity quantum mechanics thing. That's like, in some sense, that's really the holy grail of what we're looking for right now. So we were, we were talking about what Leo was just talking about. There's some papers that just came out that were like, well, if there was some weird quantum gravity stuff going on, what, you know, how, how might it affect this? So we were, we were wondering how we might be able to see it and look at it. And so, so get, getting back to this thing, you know, it's incredible, it's really incredible to me how much information we are able to extract from this waveform. We were able to determine how far away the black holes were, how massive they are, how fast they were moving around each other, um, the, the spin of the final black hole, like just so much interesting stuff. I'm, how many black holes m b binaries are there like this in the universe? I mean, we're crazy. And so, so the so the speculation is that you know w the the f the r the phase of this, like how how this waveform um, evolves with time, or is there is there some some like fuzz on it? You know, things like that could tell us about this like weird quantum mechanical, you know frothiness of space around, around the black holes. They could affect, potent, maybe, maybe, this is getting kind of crazy, but it's stuff that people, now that we know that we can see these things, maybe we can, you know, start to see if we can see that kind of fuzz on them. Can I add another comment? So this system, the first, the first directly detected gravitational wave was a lot more massive, I think. I think it's fair to say that it is a lot more massive than people expected the first detections to be, which is kind of really exciting because we learned something new about the universe that we didn't know before. But it also means that there's a lot of potential. You, you should be really optimistic about what we'll be able to learn from lower mass systems. So because this thing was so massive, what happens with these waveforms is the more massive a system is, the lower the frequency is. So if you get a higher mass, uh, sorry, if you get a lower mass system, then it will be higher frequency. Um, so if it's higher frequency, 
then LIGO will be able to see more of the cycles to the left and it will be able to do an even better job of extracting information from the waveform. So future detections could probably be better at you know, testing general relativity, seeing if the waveforms exactly agree with general relativity or if there's any you know, signs that there's deviations or corrections that need to be taken into account in the future. Days, before. days, <laughs> days. So we would, we would assume that the next one should be soon. It wasn't just luck that you turned on the new equipment. Well, if you, if you look at the, the paper that we released on Thursday carefully, you'll see that we actually say that there is, we, we, it's, there's another signal. There, there's another, we think in the, so, what, so this, yeah, this was, this is a, it's pretty crazy. You're, you're, very, you're a member of the LSC, so maybe you shouldn't. No, no, no. This, this, I could, this we can talk about. This was part of this was in, this was this was published. This was yeah, this, yeah. What we 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 basically that paper published two detections roughly. One was yeah, super clear. It published one very clear detection and one thing that maybe is very compelling as yeah. possibly another detection. And so, but the, but the thing that's crazy is that yes, we had just really just turned on the instrument to start our first observing run. And so we, we hadn't even really started the first observing run yet. We were in what's called an engineering, engineering run. So it's the period right before the observing run where we're shaking things out to make sure like, okay, everything's working properly. We're going to fix any last minute bugs. And so, you know, we were in these, this week period before the observing run started where we were during the day fixing last minute problems and then in the middle of the night, letting the detector go to just make sure it was running properly. And in that period, we got this really loud bang. And so there were a lot of us that were like, oh, wait a minute, this is, too it must perfect. have been a mistake. It's too big. It's too perfect. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I was one of those. I was super incredulous. I was, this is not, we but screwed we up something. Right. The first observation 16. run, so 16 yep. days of yep. time, right? Right, yep. And, and the first observation run went from September 18th to January, January 11th or 12th, like a January. month ago. Yeah. So there's a lot more time in yeah, there's the observation a run. Yeah, we're, we're, we're still, we're analyzing the data from the rest of the... But I'm just saying it's suggestive. <laughs> yeah. One is, another interesting thing is that the second... Um, candidate, right? So the, the one that was really loud had got the title GW right in front of it and the second weaker one was called an LVT, so I think that's a LIGO Virgo trigger. Um, but what's interesting is that, so this one wasn't strong enough to be called a gravitational wave signal, definitely, but they're 98% sure. There's a 2% chance that it wasn't, but that's not good enough for it to be called a gravitational wave right. detection. The main one was 999 Right, the five sigma. I right. think that this one is a two sigma, 2.1 2. 2. 2. sigma. That's still 98%, which is probably good enough for a lot of people, but it's not good enough for scientists to call it a definitive detection. So uh, this helps with the population statistics, but it can't really tell you, you know, what we'd want to know definitively for gravitational wave detection. Does it, do you have a question? Yeah. Um, uh, it's long and more theoretical. Well, the energy was emitted in gravitational waves, mostly, right? So we don't get this for free. When they're, gravi it's, you know, when they're merging, they're emitting gravitational waves, and this moves the fabric of space-time, and you need energy to do that. And E equals mc squared, and so the amount of mass that you lost, you can then convert into energy and say that this is uh, the final mass, and then I you can estimate the energy. A, but a slightly different question, which is, it sounds like you want to ask, was energy removed from a black hole itself, right? So the, the additional energy actually came from the fact that when two bodies fall together, they are releasing energy. So, if you, if you, so for example, it takes energy to lift something out of the gravitational field. That means that if I drop it, I can get that energy back. 
So when two black holes are far apart, there's a lot of potential energy that can be released by bringing them together. That's the, that's the binding energy. So that binding energy can be released. So it's not energy, so nothing is coming out of black holes itself, of, of black holes themselves, but it's binding energy that's being released. I, I like that question a lot. The spinal black hole has less mass, and there's the less that there's a yeah. right. binding energy that could come from the black hole. Yeah, so actually, you can do a calculation. You can, you can ask, what is the maximum efficiency of releasing gravitational waves. So th in this one, three out of 63 solar masses of energy was radiated away, which is only like four and a half percent. The total, the, the largest efficiency that you could possibly get is close to 29 percent of the energy radiated away which is huge. So gravity is the way to convert the most possible energy into radiation that flies off. So I think we're all in violent agreement <laughs> that you lose the radiation, right, through this gravitational radiation. Uh, and Leo gave a really nice explanation of how that happens. And yeah, that's one of the ways that you can get energy out of black holes. But I, I just want to say, though, that I, sim I sympathize with your question a lot because this, we, we say, you know, E equals MC squared, e, you know, energy equals mass, and mass equals energy, but sometimes it can be a little bit mysterious how that conversion actually happens. And, yeah, it's, 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 it's nice to say, well, there's, you know, there was this potential energy and somehow that gets carried away, but it's it's tricky. It's hard to it's hard to intuit it. It's it sort of tricky, and I could go on for a long time about yeah. why it's technically okay in geology. Yeah, physicists. I, I, I don't want to yeah, physicists know. spend a lot of time studying basically that question, like understanding how those where the energy hides in systems, so that you can so you can figure out how to how it gets in or out. That's a sort of a fundamental thing that you've got to have to figure Most out. Of the energy comes out during the high wave portion yeah, of right. the wave, when they break both, when they actually burn. Right, so yeah, that's when the big, yeah, that's the when you get the big energy. spike. But, th you know, these gravitational waves that are emitted, though, that's what's carrying the energy away from the system. Wait, one, one question before our one's pause. Uh, I was just informed by the the telescopes outside that Jupiter has risen so there are good views of Jupiter and they're going to pack up in the next 15 minutes or so. So if you wanted to check out Jupiter, I don't want to take away from this amazing panel, and, we'll but you guys will probably talk we'll for another. Be here for 15 minutes. Okay, so if you want to check out Jupiter, they're going to pack up in 10 or 15 minutes, but uh, our, the, the telescopes are, but you can check out Jupiter. So. Can you, see, can you, you can see all four Galilean moons. <laughs> But again, we'll be doing this every month and Jupiter will be visible. Or Jupiter's not going anywhere. It's not going anywhere. Yeah, 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 So we'll also talk about it later. So if you yeah. guys want to see Jupiter, like I would go see Jupiter <laughs> right now. There were two other questions. Has anyone not asked a question yet who wanted to ask a question? Oh, over here, over here. It's the LIGO volume. Yeah, that's. Yeah, it depends on it depends on the source. So, um, so one way we, one of the, what we you know the figures of merit of the detector, is, um, it's funny what we've been using is the figure of merit, is the distance to which we could measure a neutron star binary in spiral. So how far away two neutron stars merging together, how far away we could detect them with the detectors. We and thought those were the primary sources. We thought sources. we were looking for neutron stars. We thought neutron stars were going to be the primary source. But in fact, the, 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 the thing that the GW150914 and the other marginal thing that we talk, talk about in the paper are both black hole binary mergers. So we're, this is all causing us to rethink things right now. But the detectors for neutron stars, that, that metric is about 
for this first observing run was about 70 megaparsecs. So a, a parsec is about three point something, three, three and a quarter light years. And so a megaparsec is a million parsecs, so it's three, roughly three million light years. So 210 light, million light years is the distance to which we think we could have seen these neutron star binaries. But this black hole binary was 400 megaparsecs. So for these type of events, we can see a lot further away. And so, and this event was really loud. So th it had a really high signal to noise, rati noise ratio in the instrument. So we can see events like this even further away than the 400 megaparsecs to which we saw this event. So this event was something like 20, 24 SNR. So if you went down, oh, I'm going to mess up if I try to, yeah, that's about the detection threshold. So that's about a factor of three. So, it, so SNR goes as this one over distance squared. That's how. Right. Yeah. yeah. So. So if you put it at a, <laughs> if you put it 1.7 times farther, then the SNR will go down by a factor. Okay, so that would be about 1.7 times 400, yeah. say. So, so almost, can somebody here do math? Because yeah, I can't. So know. it's almost 800 megaparsecs. Yeah. Can you get my eyesight on the phone? Right. So. A great uh, question. Uh, when you guys ran that key on this, of the harmonics in that signal, uh, were they integer multiples, or what was the, what was the distribution of the well, harmonics? This this thing is a, is basically the F, is basically the FFT. So it, it's it's there's not a lot of there's not a lot of um, it's a very the signal is kind of clean I guess you could say there's not a lot of weird stuff going on in it at, at any given point in time it's mostly just one frequency so the, it starts off at this you know it, it like if you go if you go way out this over here. It really looks just like a sine wave. It's literally a swept sine wave. Yeah, it look, it, yeah, basically it's a swept sine wave. And that's based upon the closure uh, of the, the two points. It's, just a, it's, a very, it's just a very pure, clean source. The, these two, ma two masses orbiting around each other, when you do the general relativity calculation, it's, you know, I mean, just think, you know, the two masses orbiting around each other, that's, they, it's basically a circle. And that circle is just, I can, I can add yeah. So there, there, are, there are ways to get the signal to have higher harmonics and to be modulated. So one of the ways is if the black holes are spinning and those spins are misaligned with the orbital plane, then the system will process. You can't see it here because this is very close to the end. But if you could see more of the signal going farther to the left, then you know the, the system could be processing, and that'll in induce some modulations onto the waveform, which would show up as higher harmonics. The other ways are if the system was eccentric, then there would be not just not just a circular frequency, but a whole bunch of higher harmonics. The thing is that gravitational waves are pretty efficient at getting rid of the eccentricity in the orbit. So by the time it gets into the LIGO band, it's pretty highly circular. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention, I'm really happy that this uh, chirp is on the blackboard. So you may have heard a lot of people going whoop lately, and maybe this is the best way to, to realize why we're not all crazy, <laughs> right? So you have time going this way, and you have frequency going this way, and because it's in the audible band, this actually goes you know, from a lower frequency to this higher frequency in time. So it goes whoop, right? And that's why we've been doing it. So this is in the New York Times. I believe Leo and I were in a video where we were chirping for LIGO, because we're awesome. <laughs> Uh, and so that's so that's yeah totally uh, well everyone was really excited and so that's that's why right so it's, this is just take looking at the waveform in, in this way I just wanted to clarify that we have a new question
Well, so, yeah, the... Um, Should we do the detector? No, no, there, there, there may be two questions in your question. We'll find more questions. Right. <laughs> Do you mean about what is the detector doing that it's physically measuring, or what is the thing in space that's changing? Well, so when I read about it, I, I was in my, in my mind I was saying the distance between the yeah exactly. The so this is the detector dance. I have one arm here and one arm here, and they're 90 degrees, and one gets a little bit shorter and the other one gets longer, and then it goes like this. And so we call it like the LIGO so the dance. Is actually changing. Yeah. The distance, the, the actual distances in space are are changing. Yeah, that's the weird thing. That's the weird general relativity. That's the thing that came out of Einstein's head that blows us all, blows all of our minds. Is that he was the one that came up with this idea that gravity isn't really like a force. It's the bending of space time because of the presence of mass in the space. And so these, these it's, it's, it's sort of like, I mean, I like to think about it as space is, he, he basically turned space from an emptiness into a solid in some sense. It's not, it's not, it's no longer just something where, it's, it's no longer nothing, right? It's a, it's a thing that can, yeah, it, it's a thing that can be bent and warped and, you know, you can bang it and it'll, ring, which is basically what happens with these gravitational waves. You have these, you know, binary black holes that are causing these jiggling of the space-time itself, and then when they co coalesce, you get this, like, ringing of the space that, that moves out. So one thing I wanted to add to that is that there's been a lot of headline news saying, ooh, Einstein was right, Einstein was vindicated, Einstein did not believe in black holes or gravitational waves. <laughs> he didn't. Well, he, he changed his mind two or three times. Okay, well, initially he didn't, um, and then, uh, but to be fair, the math was really hard, and people were really confused as to whether or not gravitational waves existed for a long time. They didn't know if it was some sort of weird mistake, if it was an artifact of a coordinate system that they were choosing, and it took a long time to figure out that if a gravitational wave were to pass through a stick and the stick had beads on it, that that motion of the beads on the stick would cause heat, and therefore there has to be some sort of energy loss in the system, and therefore gravitational waves are real. But this took a, a long time to figure out. Yeah, there, there was a famous conference at uh, Chapel Hill in, I think, 1963 or 1964, where I think they took a vote at the beginning of the conference. And I think that the, the general relativity theorists were split 50-50 about whether they believed that gravitational waves were a real thing that really carried energy or whether they were just like your coordinate system is doing funny things but that doesn't mean anything physical but 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 uh, a lot of very strong very hard theoretical work in the 1960s showed that it's that, that they're undisputably real effects yeah so before history rewrites itself and Einstein knew everything always this, this would really divided the community for a very long time, and it's not a straightforward, intuitive thing that space-time has ripples in it moving at the speed of light, or that there's two polarizations. These are really deep concepts. It took a lot of really smart people a lot of time to figure out. Go back to oh, like how and when do the gravitational waves like release that energy that they're carrying? I Okay, so that's, that's, a, that's a, I mean, so one, I guess one way I would interpret your question is how does the, how does, yeah, how does the detector extract the energy from the wave as it passes by? That's a, yeah. I think that you're asking a really deep question. Yeah. Let me say two things that I, I think are simple and then we can go back to the deep stuff. So, so one thing is that Gravitational waves interact super duper weakly. So they, they basically go through everything in the universe. If you want something to absorb gravitational waves, you can do a calculation and ask, how much stuff would I need to get together to actually absorb some of the energy from gravitational waves like really efficiently? And that calculation basically says, you gotta make a black hole that's a lot bigger than the wavelength of the gravitational waves. So the only way to really absorb them is for them to fall into a black hole. So that's one answer. The one answer is that 
B gravitational waves are hardly depositing any of their energy into anything in the universe. They just fly straight through, uh, you know, out until they become so weak that, you know, even super advanced civilizations wouldn't be able to detect them. And the other thing that I wanted to mention is that, you know, it, you, you can't even say like, so like, you know, gravitational wave is, you know, this ripple thing. You can't point to anywhere in space time and say, this is where the energy in the gravitational wave is. That's not like a, a, a well-defined concept. It's, it's just like smeared out over many, many ripples of the gravitational wave. So you can't even pin down where the energy itself is. Okay, now we can try to figure out what, the, what is the deep... <laughs> so I think maybe a more... Uh, well, okay, so thanks. Um, but also, the, the concept is that the detector arms, these big like, four-kilometer-long detector arms, uh, are moved by the gravitational wave. There's, well, the whole Earth is moved, but the only way that we can notice this is in the change in the length of the detector arms. And that change in length causes an interference pattern in the light from the lasers, which we can then use to infer the presence of the gravitational wave and make really beautiful scientific waveforms like the one that you see there. It's very beautiful. So, so Jamie, do you know like, how much uh, light power like spilled out of the arms? Uh, yeah, it's like 1.21 gigawatts. No, it's nanowatts. It's okay. nanowatts, but but so not a lot. I don't need to, I don't that's want, that's I don't fine. Want to put any real numbers on that because it's it's tricky figuring out how. I don't think that we're allowed. Detected light corresponds yeah. to. We probably shouldn't answer each other's questions yeah, yet because no, we'll just start our own yeah, conversation. That's very, that's very difficult. Did we answer your Probably. question? Did we answer your question? You can, you can, you can right. say no. Because yeah, <laughs> we can keep talking. Sort of. Okay, you can talk to us after if you want some more clarifications. Do we want to talk about time slides? Yeah, well, I mean, that's, how, that's, that's how the Go for analysis it. works. Go for it. Well, so what you do is that you take, you take noise in, oh, there you are, you take noise in the detector and you, you shuffle it around, right? And you do this lots and lots and lots of times. And so here, um, they did the shuffle enough times to say that you could only get uh, a signal like this once every, what did it come out to in years? To, I thought it was 600,000. Okay. But that number um, is only because they stopped doing those shuffles. They could, they could actually have done them a lot longer and probably gotten a much stronger statistic. I heard some people even say 20 sigma. Basically, you know, this uh, Michele Valisneri is at it, but you don't know. Yeah. So, so just, this is a lower just, limit. This is a lower limit on how, um, on what the can false you alarm. Why it is that you do time slides? To, because you have, you have, so you have two detectors, right? And you want to see if there's, what the chances of seeing a signal something that looks like a signal which would travel at the speed of light from one detector to the other in the right way uh, and what's the probability of having that same signal there just due to noise. Yeah. So that's what that 5.1 sigma number is supposed to mean. How often would just new fluctuations yeah. of the noise look, look like exactly this? Like look this. Like right. Once in 203,000 years or whatever. Right. Yeah. yeah, I mean think that the, 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 the in the, without, the, without there being gravitational waves, we're just the, no, the output of the interferometer is just, no, just noise, right? And every now and then, the noise looks like that, just randomly. It's the, yeah. it's the you know, a million, a million monkeys typing on a million typewriters in a million years are going to right. write a Shakespeare sonnet or something like that. Eventually, eventually there's going to be a signal that looks like this in one of the data streams from the instrument. And similarly, Eventually, there's going to be one that it looks exactly the same in the other instrument. How, f how often does that randomly, do both instruments have the exact same signal occur in them at the same time? Well, not even at the same time, right? Separated by the light like, from the time. Right. The, the, so there's a, there's a time window, basically. And so, what, so it's even crazier. Right. But the, the, the time window is relatively short. It's the light travel time between the two instruments. And so what we do is we take the data from both of the detectors, and we slide, we slide them artificially in time relative to each other, so such no that, yeah, so it, 
Right. So there, there's no time, couldn't possibly be any time correlation between the two detectors, data streams. And then we look for gravitational waves in those co coincident data streams. And, see, and then we see how often do we see coincident signals like this. And basically, we didn't. We did that. We did enough of that to basically have analyzed the equivalent of, you know, hundreds of thousands of years of taking data. And we didn't ever see an event that looked like this. So, but we did it enough to say that, well, this does, at least this doesn't happen once every 200,000 years randomly. Yeah. So it's, it's, some, it's more rare than that. And that's where, that's where the 5.1 sigma, that's a, 5.1 sigma is a, is a lower bound on what it is. It could be 100 kept, sigma. They could have kept doing the slides. Right. But you have to Actually, you run out of data. Right, you run out of data, you run out of, you can't even, you don't have enough computing power to keep doing it, and yeah. And 5 sigma is pretty good. Five, five sigmas are sort of de facto standard. Well, it's a physical Yeah, well, we're, yeah. The we're, public we're, likes 5 sigma, so we just you gave them five <laughs> yeah, right. The public being other physicists who are going to breathe down our necks. Yeah. Um, are there any uh, plans in the future to add a third orthogonal or axis? Uh, <laughs> no, that's too hard. But there. Well, what is the, Einstein? Yeah. Einstein telescope. That'll that's a that's a that's all in the same plane. Yeah, though. Yeah, that's not in the. Speed of to yeah. No, no, no. But the way. Right. No, well, the way I, we're, we we hope to build more detectors. So that so. Rather than have build another arm on one detector, if we build another detector 90 degrees around the Earth, then one of its arms is going to be pointing in the other dimension. And, and you win at the same time. Yeah, there's other good you're, reasons you're to do that. better at localizing on the sky. Right. So like so India just got the green light, in, but it's not in really, in 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 but it's not really in which, the right place. Which Rana it's very says is, is approval. But, yeah. Australia would have been a really good place the, the Italians have, are building, they have a detector. The Japanese are building a detector. We hope to build one in India. We'd love it if the Australians wanted to build one. There's lots of empty space in Australia that would be good for building a detector. I think there was a question back there. Yeah, back there. I mean, what we like to say is that we opened a whole new window to the universe, right? Like, this is a way that you can look at stars and you can look at objects with their electromagnetic signal, so with light, and then you can also get information from them with gravitational waves, so it becomes a new way of observing the universe. And what you said earlier is right. Gravitational waves are actually ripples in the fabric of space-time. It's space-time itself that's moving and that's rippling, and so space-time is like the ocean and you can be a boat on the surface of the ocean the ocean doesn't care that you're sitting there you're still going to bob up and down and move around so this is a really key concept that it's the fabric of space-time that's moving and we're measuring that and we're getting additional information about the universe what's going to be really interesting is what we don't expect to detect so right now we have a lot of different waveforms for what binary neutron star mergers should look like black hole mergers but what else is out there that we haven't even thought about when Jocelyn Bell, for example, discovered pulsars, no one was looking for pulsars. No one had any idea that pulsars existed. Um, and pulsars are neutron stars that are rapidly rotating, that have their spin axis misaligned with their magnetic field axis. So it swoops around and we see these flashes of radio waves. So people thought it was aliens, they thought it was lots of stuff, they even called it the LGM signal, little green men. Like no one knew what that was. And that was something that they weren't expecting to discover with uh, radio waves and radio astronomy. And now pulsars are one of the most important uh, astrophysical objects that we have, especially when it comes to gravity. And the Hulse Taylor, absolutely, thank you very much for bringing that up. Let me get on my soapbox. So the Hulse-Taylor binary pulsar was a pulsar uh, in an orbit with a neutron star. And when this system was discovered, 
scientists said, oh my gosh, this system should be emitting gravitational waves, but we can't directly detect the gravitational waves from it. How can we see that the gravitational waves are really there? I know that you discovered, I know that you helped. Anyhow, so what's important is that the orbit of this pulsar, neutron star, was shrinking and they observed it for over 10 years and they're still observing it to this day. And the orbit uh, decayed in the exact fashion you would expect it to if it were emitting gravitational waves. So if it wasn't, it would probably just stay stationary and not do anything. But if it's emitting gravitational waves, the energy has to come from somewhere. Uh, and so the orbit shrinks, right? And they saw that and it's really one of the most exquisite plots that you'll ever see in your life about what the prediction is for the decay, which looks like this, and all of the points and all of the measurements that they took right, lie right on that line. And with new systems, which like for example a double pulsar system that was discovered in the early 2000s, um, the precision to which those points lie on the predicted curve is less than a fraction of a percent. So it was without a shadow of a doubt that gravitational waves existed. And this won the 1993 Nobel Prize in Physics for this observation. Um, so we knew that gravitational waves existed. We just hadn't directly detected them yet and didn't see anything like this yet, which really tells us a lot about the system. We only had this other indirect evidence in the form of the Hulse-Taylor pulsar. So thanks for bringing that up. So I wanted to, to mention that a lot of astronomy nowadays, the really exciting astronomy is transient astronomy. So people are looking for things that are changing in the sky instead of things that we know are in certain places. So just like finding supernovae, you don't know when supernovae are going to go off. You have to just constantly be monitoring all of the sky. And then once in a while, just, you know, something will get brighter and then it'll dim over, you know, a period of months. So that's a transient. And a lot of the interesting stuff in astronomy nowadays is transients. So LIGO is a lot like that in the sense that it's going to be constantly listening for gravitational waves and the gravitational wave sources, they, there could be stationary ones, we could talk about that later, but the ones like this, is, this source is a transient source. It's just a blip in the detector and that's it and we're never going to hear it again but it still tells us about the populations of things that are in the universe. Very briefly, there is also a background of gravitational waves, which is a superposition of all the gravitational waves from all of the cosmic merger history of galaxies. Um, and so that is very low frequency. Again, this is around, you know, 1 to 100 nanohertz, there's a, a whole spectrum of gravitational waves there and this is a whole background so the Earth is constantly bathed in this background of gravitational radiation and pulsar timing arrays, which is my experiment, is one of the experiments that can directly detect this and this tells us about the cosmic history of um, galaxy mergers, it can tell us about different sources so cosmic strings can make these, primordial gravitational waves can make these gravitational waves and so there's a lot of exciting stuff that you can do with gravitational waves across the whole frequency spectrum. So at the high end, you've got LIGO. In the middle, you have space-based detectors. And at the very low frequency end, you have pulsar timing arrays. So just like with electromagnetic waves or light waves, you have X-rays, you have gamma rays, you have really high frequency, uh, well, short, yeah, okay, high frequency stuff. And then you have very low frequency stuff at the other end of the spectrum, radio waves, uh, infrared, so it's almost completely analogous. Analogous. Any question over here for a long time? So, uh, this other, you mentioned other uh, space-based uh, um, observatories. You studied a lot of them. I worked on some NASA uh, experiments. Are there other uh, experimenters, uh, observers going to point there? Um, uh, so New Star, you. So New Star for everyone else is a, an X-ray observatory and Fiona Harrison here uh, is one of the, the PIs of that experiment and I'm sure that you've also made valuable contributions to it. Yeah, I saw your shirt so I was like, you've got to be... <laughs> It takes a lot to get a shirt, so awesome. So what I'm talking about is LISA, the Laser Interferometer Space Antenna, um, which a version of it is scheduled to be launched um, by the Europeans and their L3 mission which is in 2034. So this mission has been plagued by um, budgetary constraints which I'm sure you appreciate. So at first it was supposed to be a joint NASA and ESA which is the European Space Agency mission 
Um, then because of the James Webb telescope, NASA had to pull out because they had no more money left. And so ESA rebuilt plans for the telescope and had to remove one of the arms. So it was supposed to be a triangular configuration, which is cool because it would fly um, behind the Earth and it would also rotate so you could get polarization information about the gravitational waves, which is nice. Um, but that third arm had to go away for budgetary reasons. Uh, and so now there's ELISA, which has, the E has changed many times from being European LISA or evolved LISA or whatever people are calling it today. Uh, so that was the gravitational wave I, uh, detector I was talking about. And so that would be in the uh, microhertz region. Were you asking, I, I thought you might be asking about electromagnetic counterparts. Oh yeah, so there's a lot of, um, so Fermi, for example, has found a faint gamma ray burst uh, associated, well, in, in that part of the sky, so it's not sure if it's a coincidence. It's in the southern hemisphere, in that part of the sky. The, 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 the point is that it happened at around the same time. And so it's not, so there's been, as you can imagine, you know, 15 different ideas now that are obvious to people as to how a binary black hole merger can make a gamma ray burst and the archive has been flooded with new theory papers. Uh, but yeah, LIGO has lots of uh, MOUs with different telescopes and actually I think that's how some of the information leaked beforehand is that that data is public and so if you know when to look, you can say, ah, well, I saw that this particular telescope that has an agreement with LIGO was pointing at this part of the sky for no reason in particular. Therefore, I can imagine that they were doing a follow-up to a gravitational wave observation. So, but yes, there are uh, many different electromagnetic counterparts. People have theorized uh, fast radio bursts can be uh, different components to gravitational wave events, uh, gamma ray bursts. I mean, the list honestly goes on and on and on. Um, thank you guys for all of your questions. And thank you guys, because this is super informative to have, you know, three pillars of the field <laughs> discussing Wait, with each other uh, some of the questions that we've all had. So please thank our panel. And uh, yeah, come back in a month and, and we'll, we'll have a great talk and I'll see what other kind of panel we can, we can put together. So thanks for coming.